Yes, it is okay. Perfect. So, welcome everybody. Uh, today, uh, we will have uh, Jarek Kasper from University of Washington uh, discussing the first result of the muon G2 experiment at Fermilab. Uh, Jarek so did the, earn his PhD in the, electronic, in the electron spectroscopy group, working mainly on cathode neutrino experiments in the um, uh, nuclear, Institute, nuclear Physics Institute at Retz near Prague and the Republic, Czech Republic. And then he moved to uh, University of Washington, working as a research associate, as an acting assistant professor, as a research assistant professor, and finally as a scientist in the Center of Experimental Neutrino Physics and Astrophysics at the Department of Physics at the University of Washington, working mainly on the muon G2 experiment. And uh, as well, while he was doing the neutrino physics, was uh, on the SNOW Plus and the LBNF size scintillating detector. So today we'll discuss the first results. So we are very excited about that. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation and be here to, to talk about this nice result. Thank you very much. I leave you the stage. <laughs> thank you. Today I'm going to talk about the first results from the Mion G-2 experiment and Fermilab. It's the experiment to measure the magnetic dipole moment of Mion. A dipole moment is a torque experienced by a particle in the external field a spin is an intrinsic internal dipole moment. So any particle with spin will experience a torque in external magnetic field. And that's what the experiment measures. It measures directly a difference between the momentum precession and spin precession. I'll explain how that happens, but that's why it is sensitive specifically to the anomalous part of the spin. It's an interesting measurement motivated by the previous experiment that ended up in 2006 at Brookhaven. And that experiment result is in discrepancy with standard model prediction. So on this plot on the right side in light blue, you see the result from Brookhaven. And on the left side, you see the various different predictions from a standard model. And the tension between the standard model prediction and the experiment is about three sigma, a little bit more than three sigma. And the goal of the new experiment and Fermi Lab was to shrink the experiment uncertainty down to the, to the darker blue region, which should increase the, the discrepancy over five sigma, which is usually considered as a discovery threshold. Let me briefly explain where the standard model prediction, where all these numbers come from. There are multiple components to that. There are corrections from quantum electrodynamic and from weak interaction. These are calculated. These are tedious, but easy to calculate. And these are known extremely well. Then there are small contributions from hadronic physics, referred to as hadronic vacuum polarization and light by light terms. These are tiny, but these are not known very well. That's why the uncertainty on the standard model prediction is dominated by these hadronic terms. And in practice, we used colliders electron and positron colliders and interaction into hadrons. That's where the hadronic part of standard model prediction comes from. And you need to measure all the possible decay channels. You start in the two pions, three pions, four pions, kaons, and all the heavier particles. And you end up with a tree of, of cross sections and you sum them all together. It's a weighted sum. So the, the sum for the G minus two prefers low energy terms. There's the terms on the left side or the part of cross sections on this left side. But that also explain why it is hard to, to, to get it wrong because the same cross sections are used to report on alpha, the fine structure constant. So if you want to, to get the standard, if you want to change the standard model prediction, you need to change these cross sections. You need to hide the change very well so you do not bump into other well-known properties of the standard model. And there was a something called theory initiative, which is a group of about 200 scientists that started working together two or three years ago to end up with a single number. All the different theoretical groups agreed this would be the standard model prediction as of 2020. And on this plot, you see how the prediction changed over the course of 20 years. And it's still in 3.7 sigma tension with the Brookhaven experiment that the green bar here. And 
I'm going to talk about how to shrink the drink error bar now. Is there anything else? Could we use any other channels to, to improve the standard model prediction? At the moment, there is a new experiment at CERN being designed to, to measure different physics processes that also result in, 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 in the, the same cross sections. It's sketched here. The plot is a little bit difficult to read, but on the right side with the dark line is roughly what all the colliders measure. And on the left side, that the smooth curve is what the new proposal is to measure for. The left side and the right side are coupled by strong, very well known physics. So as measurement of the left side contributes to understanding of the right side. Also in the last couple of years, the lattice class calculation, lattice QCD numerical calculations improved a lot. And on the left side in this plot, in the red, we have the results standard model prediction based on electron positron colliders. And in the green, we have the different lattice groups and their results. See that the first group about a year ago reached sensitivity below 1%, sensitivity which is competitive with the experiment. But also you can see that there's a little bit of tension between the, the experimentally determined hydronic vacuum polarization, hydronic terms, and the result of the lattice UCD. That's good news. These calculations are extremely difficult and there are three, four other independent groups trying to verify this thing. The key thing here is you do not move between the tension with the standard model. You just move the tension somewhere else. So even if this thing is wrong, which is very hard to do, as I showed, you need to change very well known hydrogen cross section. Even if that's wrong, you create tension with something else. You might not have tension in G minus two, but you end up with tension with the mass of W boson, or you create tension with running alpha, the fine structure constant. So there is no safe spot. There's no easy place here to hide the tension. You only move it to different experiments, to different predictions of the standard model. Do we have an explanation at that moment? Is there anything that would naturally explain what we are looking for? And unfortunately, we do not have that. So there are many candidates. We need something that couples to leptons. We need something that couples to, to field photons and that in, in changes how neons and, and electrons interact with the field. And there are candidates, there are photons, there are alternatives to Z bosons, there are axion like particles, which is similar to photon. We have heavy physics. It doesn't work in the sense if, is there an axion that would explain the discrepancy we have? Yes, you can create one. Would it be the axion of QCD, the patchy twin symmetry that explains why the QCD is what it is? No. Would it be a good dark matter candidate? Also no. And the same on the right side, you can find a Susie Moller going to heavier and heavier physics and midst of Higgs doublets, but also you can explain G minus two discrepancy, but you do not explain anything else at the same time. Partially, that the reason is here, shown here. All the weak physics, all the WZ and photons and Higgs contribute this much. This number is three times smaller than the discrepancy we have between the standard model prediction and, and, and the experiment. So all what we know about electrolyte physics is this small. And now you want to alter the physics to hide something in there that doesn't pretty doesn't offend any other experiment, any other measurement. And it's three times larger than everything we have there at the moment. That's why it is so hard. Just one example, one more example of, of a experiment, old experiment at CERN that measured a pi zero decay into two photons. For many years, there was no red part of the, of the plot here. There was a gap. It was an interesting gap because there was a point that would explain G minus two of the muon electron and it was not in, in tension with anything else. And this is reanalysis of all data that took that opportunity away. The other complication in standard model is that you, we have a prediction for electron 
magnetic dipole moment. It comes from measuring alpha. And we know that alpha so accurately that we can put a, an upper limit on G minus two of electron. And the problem is there's a tiny discrepancy about two sigma, but the discrepancy has opposite sign than the, the, the muon one. So now we are looking for even more complex physics. We need physics that looks different to electron and, and muon. Not only it does different things, it couples differently to electrons and muons, but it also looks principally very different. Like a photon for muon and a boson, Z boson for, for electron. And it's really hard to, to create, to construct. If we think about beyond standard model, beyond standard model of physics that would explain this, uh, you know, is this the only path? Is this the only channel to do that? No, we can do different things. So the muon G minus two is designed so that we know the standard model prediction very well. So it's number we know extremely well, and we try to measure it very accurately. The other possibility, the other channel is to look for something that doesn't exist in the nature. Here's a one of the di diagrams. This would be decay of muon into electron with no neutrinos. This is heavy, heavily suppressed. So it's a process that doesn't exist in standard model or is suppressed by 50 orders of magnitude. And there are examples of the experiment. I'll just mention one, which is new to E experiment and Fermilab. So the, there are there are experiments coming with a sensitivity of you know, 17, order, 17 orders of magnitude for looking for same things, but it's more and more challenging. So this experiment will need another three, four years to, to finish construction and start taking data. Now, let me go all the way back to the principles of muon G minus two measurement. The experiment is accurate and sensitive because it measures the ratio of two frequencies. It measures the anomalous part of the spin precession frequency, and it measures the, the Lorentz. Uh, it measures the, the it measures magnetic field using using protons. It's a ratio of frequencies, which is something we can measure very well. The only problem here is we cannot measure the same the two frequencies at the same time. We can either have muons in the ring or protons in the ring. So all the complexity, all the difficulty of the measurement is how to stitch together when the muons are in the ring and the, when the protons are in the ring. This is the same. There is only a little bit of algebra from here to here, just to emphasize that it's ratio of two frequencies plus terms we know from outside. These are very, very well-known constants with you know, accuracy or of 10 ppb. Now I'm going to focus on the the the, uh, the omega a, the, the spin precision frequency. There are four ingredients. If any experiment that wants to measure anomalous precision frequency of, of muon needs to make four choices or can make four choices, we need to find a source of polarized muons. And that the most accessible one is parity violating pion decay. We need to make a decision whether we want to measure the whole magnetic dipole moment or something a thousand times smaller and directly access the, the anomalous part, which requires a ring geometry. Anything which is round, where the spin and momentum can process together, gives you access to the, the anomalous part directly. On the left side is a image that shows if there's no anomalous part, if the G equals two and both spin and, and momentum process at the same rate. On the right side is an image that shows if the spin is greater, then, then, then process is faster than the, the momentum. And by looking at the difference between the spin and momentum, you measure directly the anomalous part. And that's better thousand in sensitivity, which is too attractive not to take. The Practical problem with anything ring-like or cylinder-like is how do we keep the neons in there? And the options are weak electric field or weak magnetic field. And there are consequences of that, of that choice. And finally, we need to find a way how to see the, the neon spin. Unfortunately, we cannot see it directly. And in practice, we wait for a muon to decay into positron and that's where the parity violation in weak decay enters for the second time, because the, the daughter positron or electron are emitted in the direction of the, the momentum of the, the, the muon. 
So the information of the neuron spin gets mapped onto the information of, of electron or positron momentum. And finally, we all do this in lab frames. Unfortunately, we need to de deal with Lorentz boost with all these quantities. Let me briefly touch on all, on all these four things. Source of polarized muons, it sounds easy. You start with the muon, you let it decay, and the polarity evaluation will take off the rest. The pion decays in flight, the muon gets spin aligned in the direction of the momentum or in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, that process takes an accelerator complex size of Fermilab to, to, to get that. We start with the protons. We need to, to hit, we, we let the protons hit a inclinal target. We collect all the, the secondary particles. These are pions, positrons, and deuterons, heavy, heavier stuff. We spend some time in the rain to, to, to separate them from each other, to you know, give the pions time to decay into muons, get rid of everything else we do not want. And finally, we take the clean bunch of, of muons and inject it into the storage ring. Here's a, the, there are three or four equations in the talk. I try to keep it light, but here is a simple math showing that the circular geometry, ring or cylinder, really measures only the animal's part. So this is the cyclotron frequency. This is the spin precession and the difference gives you a, the anomalous part of, of dipole moment directly. The only extra term we have to deal with, so this equation of spin is not all the terms. There is one more. And this is the term for coupling velocity of the muon to electric field. It's a very, very weak field, but it's the field that, that contains the demions vertically to make sure they stay in the range for about one millisecond when we let them decay. And there's a term in front of it. So the thing in parentheses is the animal's magnetic dipole moment and gamma factor, which is momentum effectively. So we can create, we can construct the experiment so that this term cancels. And turns out it's about three GeV momentum that cancels the animal's part as, as, as known today. For a long time. And this is, you know, can be, can be design experiment, which is different or how different it can be. And this is pretty much the only difference we have. And there is a new experiment being built at J-Park in, in Japan that made the opposite choice. And I'll show what, what it, what it means to not to take this electric field to, to store muons in the rain. And finally, we need to, to measure the, we need to report on, on the spin. And that's the part evaluation in we decay one more time. You let the muon decay. And that's only after that when we can access the spin because the daughter positron or electron carry the information on, on the spin in their momentum. And Here's a comparison between the Fermilab experiment, which is the fifth generation of all these experiments. There were three at CERN in starting in late 50s. There was one at Brookhaven, and this is the final iteration at Fermilab. And if you do not use E field, you end up with something bad. You have a bottle, it's a bottle you inject your muons in and you let them fall down. They use very, very weak magnetic field make sure they cannot fly away. But there is no electric field, the muons really fall down. And this is the experiment design you, you end up with. And the only complication is how to inject the muon so accurately, they will naturally fall down. They won't need any other containment, any field. And again, it takes a accelerator complex to, to do that. To control momentum so accurately, you need to stop the muons. You do that by, by aerogel, which is a thing that turns a muon, stops it down, and forms muonium. Muonium is atom with electron orbiting muon. The advantage is this is stable. So that's how you can stop muons and keep them there, sitting there without them decaying. They naturally leave the aerogel, the, the sponge, out. And when they do, you use a strong laser to kick off the, the positron or uh, sorry, the electron and you re-accelerate. This takes time, that's where there are losses, but also starting from rest, 
allows you to, to control the momentum accurately enough. So then when you inject the neurons into the, the, the bottle, the, the magnetic bottle, they simply fall slowly down. And the rest is the same. You wait for the muons to decay and you measure the, 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 the decay positrons. That's how you know what spin that the muons had when, when they decayed. For the only, you know, because it's so compact, you, you use different things. You can use silicon strip sensors in, in G minus two Fermi, G minus two, we use calimeters, I thought about that. But this is the only principal difference between the Fermi experiment and the, the experiment in Japan. The Fermi experiment to the smart choices or the easy choices to be more sensitive. This is more difficult. And that's why they aim to reproduce the previous result at, at Brookhaven. They do not compete in, in sensitivity of the experiment, but they try to be as independent as practically possible to verify the result. Here's the last equation in, in this talk. It explains that you can cancel, you can cancel the electric field term, but you can do it only for one narrow momentum by, which is the line here. And you see how wide the momentum distribution is at the Fermi experiment. And all these muons with higher or lower momentum contribute to your systematics. And it is difficult systematics because you get two sign flips. If the momentum is higher than the ideal one, there are two flips, you know, the electric field and the, the momentum have the same sign. If you go on the other side, both signs change. So there is no cancellation. If you are off the, the magic, the ideal momentum, you are getting correction. How large are the correction? About 500 ppb, which is the sensitivity, sensitivity of the experiment or the third of the discrepancy we have. So that the part of the experiment is how do we measure? How do we know where the muons are? How do we measure these distributions correctly? How do we know the, the velocity distribution and how well we know the electric field that contains the muons inside the ring. So let me talk about how it's done. Here's a sketch through the ring. So in magenta, we have the muons stored on that orbit, spinning around, running around, and at some point they decay. This is the point. When they decay, the daughter positron doesn't have sufficient energy to stay on the orbit, it curves inward, and that's where we put kilometers. And here's a image what the kilometer sees. The lighter color means there are more positrons hitting the kilometer, the darker means there are fewer of them. So on the X axis, we have time. On the Y axis, we have the energy of the decay positron. The three GeV muons have decay have half life of 64 microseconds. So you know, it slowly decays over the course of 700 microseconds. And what you see is that the omega A, the spin precession, that brings the aligns the, the, the momentum of the positrons with the spin or in the opposite direction. If we count, if we sum all the particles and all energies, this would be flat. The positron always goes somewhere. But if we put an energy cut, energy threshold, we sell it, you know, we, we turn the, the angle between spin and momentum into energy. So by selecting only high energy positrons, we create a fluctuation, a wiggle in the number of positrons hitting the kilometer. Here's a sketch what can go wrong. Imagine that the energy threshold, the blood line is not stable from early in the field, early when we inject the muons to late. That would distort the, 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 the wheel of the, the plot we measure. Also, if we have beam changes, it would turn the, the sharp ridges, the straight ridges into something more complex. How could that be? Imagine that we lose muons in a different, through different channels, that they do not all decay as expected, but some of them escape. They might collide, they might run into the walls of the vacuum chamber. 
they might collide with each other. That also distort the spectrum, especially if some of them, let's say, preferentially the high momentum ions, have an escape channel the low momentum ions do not have. But that's the difficult part of the experiment to make it stable early to late. Early to late means four orders of magnitude change in the number of positrons hitting the kilometers. We wait about 10 decay times, 10 half lives of, of the muon that creates four orders of magnitude early to late. How do we build the design? How do we design a thing that can measure the thing? So we have specs. We need to create this plot. So we need something that will measure the heat time and also will measure the energy. The requirements on the time are more strict, are more difficult than the requirements on, on energy. We are asking for about 100 picoseconds for energies of 100 MeV so for all energies. We do not need to know the energy very accurately. We only use the energy to place a cut, but we want that to be stable in time. If this line is a little bit higher or lower, it doesn't change the physics, it doesn't change the result, but we want the line to be as flat as possible. So that's the item three here. How stable should the energy scale be? And we are asking for 10 to minus three, so we want, which is hard to guarantee without a monitoring device. And I'll talk about it. And finally, there is something called a pileup. Imagine you have two positrons under the black line that hit the same part of the kilometer at the same time. If you cannot tell it's two of them, if you merge them together, suddenly you have a hit, you have a addition above the black line. We do not want that. And this says we, you know, the spec is we want to reconstruct everything that happens about five nanoseconds. If the time between two positrons hitting the kilometer is greater than five nanoseconds, we want to know their energies and 66% below five nanoseconds. How is it done? Here's a kilometer view from a positron side. So you are the positron about to hit the kilometer and you see a stack of lead fluoride crystals and a silicon photomultiplier to read them out. Here's a view from the other side. You see the lead fluoride crystal and you see the, the silicon photomultipliers. It's a combination of pure Chernikov radiators. It, it's crystal, looks like glass, is as heavy as lead, it's really heavy, and it produces Chernikov photons. There are not many of them, we do not need many of them, but we need this thing to be super fast, and this is the fastest process out there. So there is no scintillation in, in, these, in these crystals, it's only pure Chernikov light. And then we need to count the photons. When the photons leave on the, the rare side of the crystal, we want to count them. And silicon photomultipliers was the right choice for the experiment because they are non-magnetic in two ways. They operate in magnetic fields and they do not distort magnetic field. The only difficulty is you can only buy the chip, you can buy the device, you can buy the camera, you can buy the house. Imagine you are buying a photo a phone you can buy the, the, the chip that takes photos, but you have to build your phone around it. And that's what we did. It wasn't difficult. It was tedious in the way we iterated 16 times roughly to get it right. But also it's quite cheap, way cheaper than the classic photomultiplier tubes you can see in snow or snow plus. So this is cheaper. It's more involved on your side. You need to build a small electronics board to get the, the signal out and the other when you have the signal when you turn photons your light photons into to electric signal you need to digitize the signal somehow you have to store the, the signal and that's the other difference between the latest generation of the experiment and Fermilab and the previous one we continuously record everything happening in the kilometer for the duration of, of you know, for the one millisecond and we do all the processing in software so we have a GPU form that chops the, the long trace into the regions of interest. And we are trying to store everything we, we can. So if we have a need to reprocess it, if we, find a, if we find a problem with our data preparation, we can redo it. The other key to the success of the experiment is reproducibility and redundancy. So we didn't rely only on simulation. Of 
course, all these had Monte Carlo simulation, John 4 simulation behind the design and, and commissioning. We took the device to a test beam. Slack is a lab, lab on the West Coast, West Coast that can produce 3 GeV positrons, that's the, the particle, loader particle difference, and it can create any number of them, and they can put a time structure. So if you ask them to give you two, three, EG, two, three GeV positrons, 4.5 nanoseconds apart, you will get them. And what you, you see in, in purple, you see the signal from, 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 from this device. So you can see we can separate the two blue and red correctly. And we tested different energies, we tested different angles, we tested different multiplicities to have a data-driven model, the 100 kilometer. And the model was in good agreement with the Monte Carlo prediction. And that's the, the level of redundancy, redundancy we, we hoped for to have. Here is a result from, from also from, from Slack, proving that if we kill the device, if we use LED, to, to kill all the pixels on, on the device, to fully saturate it. And a few nanoseconds later, we, we ask it to detect a positron, it would. Of course, if the device is, is dead, it's overwhelmed, there's a little bit change of gain, but this thing is stable. This thing is irreproducible, known and corrected for. Also, it's in good agreement with the, the simulation, with the spy simulation, which is a tool to, to simulate these things in electronics. And here's an example of what, what you see in, if you analyze data. If we sum, if we take the 2D histogram, if we collapse the, the beams in, in the Y direction, we get a villa signal on the right side. And there are only about five parameters of interest, so it's not too complex. The complexity comes if when we add all the other things, all the, the correction from, from beam dynamics. But also, it's still not overwhelming. It's still perfectly fitable using a parametric model, which is how the analysis is done. So it's tedious, it's complex, but it's not, it, it's transparent. There is not many, not much processing between what you record and what you publish. Going back to the redundancy, we have a device that looks what the neurons do and that's a straw tracker. So around the ring at three different locations, we had something called a straw tracker, which is mylarized straws filled with argon eating. And when a particle flies through it, you get a spark, you get an electrical signal. And if you have multiple walls, multiple la layers of these things, you can reconstruct what exactly the neurons do, where they decay from, they, where they arrive from, and where they are going. And that's what it is used to build redundancy to improve our understanding. So we can measure the profile of, of stored muons. We know where the muons are. Of course, we only see them after they decay, the daughter rings flies through the tracker, but we know that very accurately. We can use it to address pileup. This thing, usually if you have two particles hitting the kilometer at the same spot, at the same time, they have two different origins. And this device can tell you where they originated from. This is also sensitive to all those muons escape in third region. Imagine that the muon hits something, wall of the chamber, it loses a bit of energy, it curves inward, and that's where, where these devices are. So they can accurately tell us there are unwanted processes and unwanted channels for the muons to escape or not. You know, that's how we can put an upper limit on, on, on that part. And it's also, as a sidestep, it measures accurately the pitch. It can tell you where the decay positrons fly to, whether it's going up or down, and both would be a measure of something called electric dipole moment, which would be one of the explanations for the discrepancy between the, the standard model prediction and the experiment. All right, here are just three I can deploy. So on the right upper corner, you see the, the image of the mean as the function of time as measured by the trackers. So you can see that things move a little bit from higher ready to, to lower ready. On the left bottom plot, you can see two blobs. One of them are positrons, the other ones are muons. So this thing can tell very accurately what are muons and what are what are positrons and what they do. And finally, the, the result on the right bottom plot is a slice. 
radial slice that tells you where the beam is stored, which is part of the systematics that we need to know what the muons are doing, where they are, and it enters the, the, the highest or the biggest correction we have, which is the correction related to, to the electric field. So this is how we know where the muons are, and then we have a measurement of the electric field. So we measured very accurately, we mapped all the electric electrodes, and we measured the field. So it's a combination of this plot and the electric measurement that reduces the uncertainty on the e field correction down to below 100, 100 ppb. All right. Finally, in terms of redundancy, it's the same data, but we did six completely independent analysis using two completely different reconstruction methods. There are details to the method. We, on purpose, try to be as different as, as possible. And you can see the results here. So these are different people doing different things with the same data and how they agree. It's, and it's on purpose designed to be as different, as independent as, as possible. So that's the different analysis analyzing the same data for the precision frequency of the muon. Now, going all the way to the, the how the experiment is good, how the sausage is made, let me talk about the bottom term here. It's the field measured by, by protons. So yet again, we measure ratio of two frequencies. The first one is what the muons see. The, the other one is what the protons see. And that's, we want to measure the field when the muons are stored and where the muons are stored. Thanks to the tracker, we know where the muons are. And unfortunately, we cannot do both at the same time. So we somehow need to stitch the measurement from the, when the muons are not there and when they are there. And here it is, done, how it is done. So the goal to success is to start with a very, very uniform magnetic field. There are many layers to, 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 to the field, to uniform field. And here's a step, section of, of the, the magnet. It's true we used, we reused the magnet from the previous experiment, but we did it differently on, on purpose. So you reuse the heavy steel, you reuse the pole pieces, all these veggies and, and machines. However, we had access to a technology the previous experiment did not. So we shimmed the magnet, we put it together the best way we could. Then we measured the field. We measured the discrepancy from the ideal design field. And we used a laser cutter to, to fill in the gaps in the field using magnetic, magnetic steel. And you see how tiny, you know, there are 10,000 of tiny, tiny laser cut strips here that were accurately placed into the magnet to, to, to get the, the you know, the desired uniformity. So also it's the same magnet, it's done very differently using different processes to, to get the uniform field. And also this is the passive system. And then we have an active system, system of coil, fine coils. It was also designed completely from stretch. Back to how we measure the field. We use an MR probes, which is a device that measures the, the, the amplitude of the field. We put them into a trolley, which is the thing left bottom, and we let the trolley run around the ring. There are 17 NMR probes, well calibrated NMR probes inside that measure the field where the muons are. Unfortunately, not when the muons are there because the muons cannot fly through the trolley. So when the trolley is not there, we need something to, to stitch the, the measurement, the trolley measurement, and that's 400 NMR probes placed above and below the storage region. And again, this device was designed from stretch. It's a similar device to the previous experiment. It is an NMR probe, but it uses a different sensitive volume. The previous one was based on water or sulfur and copper. This is based on petroleum jelly. So it's different medium, new probe. And that's the probe that report on the stability, continuity of the, the field. And for comparison with the previous experiment, we have an external MRI magnet at Argonne National Lab, where we compare our trolley, all the probes inside. We have the probes from the previous experiment, and also we have we measure the devices from the upcoming Japan Japanese experiment. So all three experiments are cross calibrated using one device, one, one magnet, and also there was new 
method, completely new helium-3 probe design to cross-shape the, the absolute calibration of the probes. Important thing here is, even if the, the absolute calibration is, is different between the helium-3 and, and the classic probes, the all experiments are stitched together, cross-calibrated with, with each other. For the field analysis, magnetic field analysis, we had two independent teams, each doing two in the different analyses. So that's a level of redundancy we had on the field side. You see the differences between two methods and you see the string chart you know, of the, the systematic table. The important part is, is the measurement and the analysis is on track to meet the, the specs, to meet the goal. And the last ingredient here is blinded cloud frequency. We measure ratio of two frequencies. The, the cloud generator the, the, are fed from the same standard, which is detuned. It's detuned in the wide range, you know, 25 ppm. The goal of the experiment is 0.5 ppm. And there are two people, two senior scientists from Fermilab who knew that the offset. And the fortunate thing about this experiment is you can take the offset, you can take the wrong frequency, propagate it through the analysis from the beginning to the end, and you end up with the same offset. There are no second order corrections. There are no cross terms. It's really offset at the beginning and the same offset at the end. So you can analyze your experiment blindly. It's such a wide range. And only at the end, you can shift the result based on the offset these two guys dialed into the, the generator all right and here's the result in blue we have the previous experiment in red we have the new experiment at fermilab and in green we have the, the standard model prediction if we combine the previous experiment and the new experiment we end up with 4.2 sigma tension can we combine the experiments yes we can what these vertical bars show is the statistical part of the uncertainty and the, the whole bar is the compound. So the, the, this is the correction from systematics. So we have two experiments dominated by statistics with compatible center values. That's why we can combine the results together to end up with 4.2 sigma. So here's in purple is the new work experiment average. The results were published as a series of four papers. The Physics review letters is the more accessible one, but there's a lot of supporting documentation and information on the 10 pages that are easy to read. What we published was run on data. So the experiment runs for multiple years and each year is referred to as a run. So we, this is what we published and this is what we have at the moment, about 11 times more than the statistics of the previous experiment. And the goal of the experiment is to continue taking data up to 21 times the statistics of the previous experiment. In preparation, it's analysis of round two and the other two years, round two and round three. And we are hoping to publish the result in about a year from now. And we have two more years of guaranteed data taking. It's not only more data, it's also better data. So we work hard on improving stability, temperature stability, which is the largest contribution to the systematics on the field side. And after round two, we managed to, to stabilize the temperature of the magnet and the hole, and you see the improvement in temperature stability between round two and round three. Also, we worked hard on, on, on systematics, improving the control of systematics. And after, you know, took us two, three years, but we finally are storing the muons exactly where we want them to store to, to minimize that systematics. So that's the other good news from, from, from run one from this experiment that we met the systematics goals. If we continue taking more data towards the goal of 100 PPB statistical, the systematic part will not be larger than that. So the systematic is fully under control at the moment. So let me conclude. The Fermilab experiment determined the anomalous part of muon precision frequency with the precision of 460 ppb, which is better than the previous experiment. It's only a small fraction of the data. The experiment continues taking data. It's well on its way to the goal of 140 ppb. And after the first year of data taking, 
the combined world average of the, the experiments is in tension with the standard model and the tension currently stands at 4.2 sigma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Very, very nice talk. A lot of information. Are there any other questions? Any other? No, because we didn't even start it. Any question or comment or Yarek? Uh, Yona, I don't know if it's a lowercase l or an uppercase. L. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. It's me. It's Fabrice. Oh, ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it, keeps on it keeps on resetting to my uh, to my daughter's name. My apologies. So it's Fabrice Rotier from Triumph. Actually, I was just curious about the uh, lead fluoride uh, system. Uh, do you know what is the PE per kV that you achieve or the number of photon electrons per unit energy? with that lead fluoride system? So we are collecting about thousands of photons per GeV. I see, but thousand per GeV is the rough number. Okay. So right. you, you see 511 keV peak? Very, very poorly. I see, okay. But again, okay. it was, well, great. It was yeah. a choice, yeah. but not shown here or not very well. You see a black wrapping and you know, so, we, yeah. so everything that's no total internal reflection is sacrificed. We did that on purpose. You know, we tested by wrapping, by diffusive wrapping that collected many, many more photons. But again, it was not the goal. For us, we have plenty. There is plenty and plenty of photons. Even if we, if we end up with 3,000, 4,000 photons, that's many more we need to, to, to meet the, the energy goal of 5%. So this was intentionally optimized for simplicity. So any wrapping that returns photons back in adds to the complexity of the model. And it, I know it's nice okay, yeah. good to have, but it, it went against the, the design of the, of the device. So we, we optimize for simplicity here on purpose. Okay, no, great, thank you. Thanks Fabrice. Are there any other questions or comments or doubts? Jeter, you are well, next. If you're, asking for, if you're asking for doubts, then no, uh, that was a very nice talk. Thank you. Um, wh which part did you work on? I built the color meters. How you brought these? Very nice. Um, what is the shrink up threshold? I was just curious while you have the picture up. Uh, 260 KUE. Okay. Thank you. So this is, um, it looks yeah. like light. It's really, it's 1.8. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's very nice, actually. The reason I was asking my question is because I looked at that for that at some point. That was, but yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, it's very, it's beautiful. Um, I, I was just curious as to some of your thoughts on let's say we uh, confirm this discrepancy between the standard model and um, the magnetic moment. What, where do you see the science going next? If you confirm that that discrepancy is at a large significance. If we look at the bigger picture, it's not the only discrepancy we, we have. There's experiment at CERN called LHCB that measures decay into kaons and then into neons and electrons. And there's a tension there. We have th many three sigma tensions in there. In simple words, they observe many fewer neons than electrons. So it's a similar process that seems to prefer electrons to muons. And that would be third motivation, something called laptop quartz that would explain both. So if that's confirmed, and they recently published in another three, three point something result, and they are on the track to, to publish more, and they are approaching channels that are more interesting because they are simpler to calculate. They are very clean channel. They are harder to, to, to refuse, you know, harder to, to question. It might take another couple of years 
before they, they publish results from those crystals. But if that discrepancy is confirmed, it would point towards something like lepto quartz, something that couples to both leptons and quartz and somehow prefers one of the lepton families. So the, you know, the easiest theoretical model is something that couples to neons only and not to electrons. And that would perfectly explain this thing. So for, for them, for the collider, the neons have another channel to, to escape, to decay, which is not observed in the experiment. And for us, it changes the, the strength, the coupling between, and would explain that too. Thank you. So Larry, you're next. Um, <clears throat> could you explain, uh, again, I didn't quite catch the argument on why we can't just think of this as a discrepancy between the two theory calculations, the lattice calculation and the uh, standard model uh, Feynman diagram calculation? Sorry. So the lattice calculation is really hard, really difficult. And a huge effort is going in, into, into that calculation. And there is a lot of lattice calculation, even in, in the standard model, uh, about what the theory initiative agreed on. So these light by light diagrams are mostly based on, on lattice calculation. There's a little bit of phenomen phenomenology that makes the, the calculation easier and more attractive. But there's a lot of theory, a lot of QCD calculation going in already. Here's a cross section and above some energy, above some energy, it's you see the only, but you also, this is the logarithmic plot of the cross sections. And you can really see how, how, how much the higher energies are suppressed. So even if the QCD calculation above 3 GeV is not that great, it's sufficiently enough for this thing. So the change is now that the QCD, the lattice is going to lower and lower energies. It's going all the way down to, to rest mass of the, the pion but it's also getting more and more difficult. And it's a good thing that they reach there. They, they, they have a result, first result. It's also good that we have independent groups. And it's not a new, it's not a new thing when the previous experiment at Brookhaven published the result in 2001. There were there are also discrepancies on a larger level. So at some point the, the community preferred electron and position colliders and the decays into hadrons. But before that, you know, experiments like Bell, Babar, and Brooker, experiments of Brooker. But before that, there was another channel. You can start from tau, you can look into tau decay into hadrons and those two, from certain experiments like lab. And those two predictions didn't agree. And the agreement is getting better, but the community, the theoretical community prefers these numbers because they are easier. If you start from tau, you have much more nuclear physics you need to put in to extract the same same numbers. So, you know, the discrepancy or between the standard model and, and the, the standard model between the experiment and standard model prediction are nothing new in this business because it's really difficult. But I know this is not the best plot to demonstrate that, but it really shows you cannot hide. There is not sweet spot. There is no sweet spot between. In between, you always violate something. Something we know very, very well. Wherever you try to hide. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other question? Last call for question. If not, I would like to thank Yarek a lot very much. Very, very nice talk. And if I could get uh, your slide, it would be great. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank and you. Have a good day or evening or whatever <laughs> you are. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. See Bye -bye. you. Bye. And I would like to remind everybody the future project workshop next week. So no seminar. Bye. <laughs>